Hey everyone, David here. I know I'm a little late with this review, but better late than never because this is a game that I've been wanting to talk about for some time, but I've been finding some difficulty letting go of. Finally, pushing it behind me, I can freely and comfortably talk about Injustice 2. Reason for why I say this is because I simply was not expecting to spend the amount of time that I did on Injustice 2. I spent the time playing this game that I did any other fighting game in recent memory, and there's a good reasoning f for that, but before I get to what makes or breaks this game, is that this is the follow-up to the first Injustice game from the creators of the Mortal Kombat series, most specifically Ed Boon and his NetherRealm Studios team. And they are able to utilize their mechanics and their engine to now bring forward this fighter that takes DC's best heroes and villains and puts them up together for the fight of the universe, or at least one of the many universes, because now we got a new villain entering the fray that is destined to conquer all knowledge from every universe imaginable and that is Brainiac. So now we find our very unlikely heroes and villains use, uh, utilizing very unlikely alliances to be able to thwart this new evil. It's always peculiar that a fighting game has a story mode to begin with and usually when it does it's only like an hour, hour and a half, maybe even two hours where they just kind of meander a little bit or kind of half facet. Just recently I actually played Soul Calibur 5 and the story mode for that game is not all that great. It's not terrible, but it's like, okay, one second you're using fully CG rendered cutscenes and then the next you're using like storyboards and you're cutting back and forth. I'm like, why can't, why, why can't you just strike a level of consistency and the dialogue is not all that great and the characters, especially the main character was kind of a... Here, however, Ed Boon is dedicated to not just his Mortal Kombat franchise, who also has a hefty story mode that, ha that deals with a number of hours, even though it's not the most polished or the most... Uh, most deeply written story mode because it teeters on the level of campiness that the Mortal Kombat franchise is known for, but at the same time, it's not known for that. With the, D the DC universe, however, more specifically with Injustice, they were able to flesh out their characters and be able to utilize the whole notion that this is a superhero, supervillain, comic book based universe to be able to d devote time to a story mode that uh, that has a story within it that is like a comic book type of arc that you go through various issues and you're like, oh my god, we're jumping from storyline to storyline or universe to universe and we're mixing and matching all these characters, but at the same time paying respects to to their powers, to their personality, to their backgrounds, all this stuff, and be able to not betray anybody or do anybody injustice, as the title says. And that first story mode for that first game was really, really good. Very unexpectedly, for some people, it may have been a little convoluted towards the end where we're starting to jump from world to world and people were trying to identify who was the bad Superman versus who was the good Superman. And it started to confuse some people. Not necessarily me, but some people thought that it started to lose its way towards the end. With this story mode in Injustice 2, we deal, without getting into spoilers, we deal with the universe that had its villains kind of become heroes and its heroes kind of become villains and mixing and matching because we were dealing with two universes in the first game. Now we simply just continue the storyline with the universe in which Superman went crazy and we had the insurgency and we had all that stuff. We deal with the story mode for the just that universe and we leave the other one, the much more mundane one alone where Superman is still Superman, Batman is still Batman and the villains are still the villains. Here we continue the much more interesting route where various characters aren't exactly filling the roles that they're dealing with. However, because it starts to take a much more traditional route because we introduce Brainiac and when you introduce a villain that neither hero can take on by themselves, you kind of have a prediction of where things are going. These characters that didn't get along at one point, especially Batman and Superman and their allegiances, their teams that follow them to the bitter end, are going to have to form some alliances. Some alliances that they don't want to form, but they're going to have to deal with this shit because... You got an even bigger bad guy out there that needs to be taken care of. So obviously things are going to have to be set aside for now. And because it's a storyline that we've kind of seen before, it's the one thing that makes me go, okay, even though this storyline is still very damn good because it, it takes care of its characters and their mythologies and where they come from and all of that and never betrays anybody, I still prefer the storyline to the first one. There was something about the first one that made it fun to kind of connect the dots as to who's the good guy here, who's the bad guy here, and which universe are we jumping in between here and there. And it was I, there was a level of fun that I found to that. Whereas here, since we're stuck in this just one single storyline, 
it, it kind of dropped a little bit for me. Even though it still had its inclusion of things that we didn't see before, like Supergirl and other mythologies that we've never seen before and other characters that we've never seen before introduced here. Some of which I think could have been introduced a little bit better because there were some characters that literally just drop in for like a scene and then they just go away and I'm like, okay, that was partly random. I don't know why they just dropped in there. I, okay, I'll, I'll take it, but... Some story elements could have been used a little bit better th that were used better in the first one. Even though that game did have its fair share of random appearances where just some character appears and I'm like, okay, like I remember Ares appearing out of nowhere in front of Wonder Woman and be like, hey, look at me, it's Ares. This game has its own Ares that appears and says, ha, here I am. And I'm like, why the fuck are you here? You have nothing to do with the story. Why are you here? Here's the thing. Often in the commercials, I would see that one of the selling points behind the story mode was that it's the most cinematic story mode put to video game form for the DC universe. That's kind of true because this is probably one of the most cinematic presentations that I've seen for story mode, not only for a DC game, but probably a superhero game because whether it be in the cutscenes or in the designs for the characters, the voice acting, or even the facial animations, there is some work put into even the smallest details. Whether it be from the, a certain camera angle that displays a character or even a villain in a certain mode that makes him, makes him or her look holy, like, holy shit, uh, very impressionistic. Is that a word? But even some of the little ticks and things that they put in certain faces where I'm like, wow. You don't necessarily have to put like every single crease in the skin or anything like that, but they were able to give give the movements right to where I felt more for these CG characters than I do with some of the most recent DC movies. With the exception of Wonder Woman. You guys seen my review for that? If you haven't, check it out on my channel. But I felt more for these characters, not only with the way that the performances were done with the voice acting from Kevin Conroy, Tara Strong, and so many other DC veterans but performing their voices for the characters, but also because of how they were written and how they were presented. And sure, some designs are better than others, and I'm glad that some were actually fixed. As much as I like Batman, Never liked his design in the original Injustice. There was something about the way his head, his head sculpt or his cowl was designed that just felt off to me. And they fixed that here in this new game because he looks much more traditional but at the same time like a new version of Batman. Which then leads me to something that is very much open to debate and that's the roster. This is the largest roster that we've seen in the Injustice games. And it's a very good roster but it's also a very subjective one because I feel like this is the case for various ga fighting games. Whether it be the superhero fighting games or the Mortal Kombat games. Hell, even Smash Brothers. There's always going to be a set of characters that you're going to look at and be like, could have done without these guys. They're not bad, but I could have easily taken these characters out, switched them out for some other characters I would have preferred to have been in this game. And some are written off in this game because of certain circumstances that went down in the first story mode for the first game. So that kind of makes sense. But at the same time, you did bring back another character that was presumably dead or a couple characters that were presumably dead. So why couldn't you bring this one other person but not the other one? So there's various arguments to be made. And of course, the fighting styles do ca ca cater to the characters that you're playing as. So you got your heavier characters that are a little bit slower, but they're much more powerful. You also got some characters that are very nimble and quick. They're not the strongest, but because of the amount of punches that they're able to sink in, they're going to be able to match that. And of course, the only way to find out which character is for you, whether it be from a design, standpoint or from a fighting gameplay style standpoint it's up to you to try at least all of these characters once and then you'll make your judgment for yourself because everybody's got their batch of characters so you go that you look at it and go oh my god that's the character I even if it's a character that you weren't expecting to love I thought Scarecrow was going to handle a little bit weird, and he's actually one of my favorite fighters to play as, especially when I'm able to use that that uh, move where he swings the hook over and over and over again, and he's able to repeatedly hit a character, and then off of that, I can combo into a, a into a move where he uses the hook as a grapple, pulls, and then punches. It, it all depends on who you try out. You never know who you're going to end up falling in love with, and you never know who you're, you're going to ultimately hate fighting as or fighting against. Green Lantern, that single punch, every time I keep thinking he's going to de devote himself to a combo, he just punches once and I'm like, where's the fucking... The core engine of how these characters fight against each other is 
mostly the same as it was in Injustice 1. You are going to notice some differences, even with some returning characters. Like, for example, Batman, he fights a little bit differently than he did in the first one, and obviously they're not going to rinse and repeat the exact same super moves. All their super moves are completely different. Some are better than others. You're probably going to look at some and be like, I prefer their super move in Injustice 1 than they did here, and that's all open to opinion again. And, of course, you got some brand new characters that you've never seen before, and they got their own set of gameplay styles, their own set of super moves, their own set of counters, and it's all all up to you to decide who you like with versus who you think is a hindered or handicapped or whatever. That's all up into uh, it's open to interpretation. But one thing that is included in the gameplay that I think was there in the first game, and if it wasn't, it's now included into this game. Uh, I'm not entirely sure, but I think this is a brand new mechanic for this game. And it's one that for the first half of the time that I spent with this game, I played this game for about 20 hours, and for the first 10 or so hours, I kind of ignored this mechanic. And now I feel tremendously bad about that because during the last five or so hours of playing this game, while I was doing some of the bonus things that you could do, I decided to give this mechanic a chance, and I'm glad that I did. And that's the meter burn mechanic, where you're able to... Fill up this meter, and usually in the first game, filling up the meter would allow you to, like, use certain things with your power button, which is, like, either the circle button on the PS4 or the, what is it, the B button, I think, on the Xbox One, and usually that's able to bring out certain things that have to do with that character. Like, for example, Batman's going to be able to bring out his bad ranks, or Bane's going to be able to use up his juice, his venom, and by uh, etc, etc, for so many other characters. Here, however, you're able to burn off those meters by pressing one of the triggers, and that allows certain combos to extend further than what they already were. And you're able to kind of milk out more powers, more moves out of your character that you have never seen before. And that was really unexpected, and when you're able to utilize it right after a number of practice, holy shit, you're going to be able to do so many other cool co combos and finishers and breakers and so many other things like that with your character that you've never seen before. And that added to the replay value. That made me want to go back and try other characters and be like, okay, what do they do if I use up this meter burn and how many times can I fling and ping pong my character into the air? And again, I apologize if this mechanic was in the first game because I can't remember 100%, but here I was able to utilize it much more effectively. And it doesn't stop there. There's various other combos or abilities that you can unlock in the game as you progress thanks to the highly addictive oh my god i can't believe they put this in here but speaking of replay value injustice 2 introduces the loot and gear system where you're actually able to take your superheroes and villains and being able to not only level them up but add gear and abilities and customization options to these characters that you already know of so you take what you already know and you're able to elevate and add on top of that why warner brothers Inter interactive why ed boon why nether realm because of this factor alone is because why it's it's the reason why i spent more time on this game than i did on any fighting game because after having completed the story which has its own fair share of replay value because Without spoiling anything, there's a thing that could have turned out a different way, but the only way to unlock that certain thing is to be able to go back and do a couple of more matches, and then you can kind of get like the alternate ending, and that's cool by itself. But then after that, there's this the replay value in the loot and gear system, where you're able to add armor, you're able to add things on characters' heads, you're able to change the colors, you're able to add abilities, and of course, adding the gears is not just for cosmetic reasons. You're actually able to. Uh, rank up the uh, the strength, the defense, the ability, the health, all this stuff for all these other characters up to a level cap of about level 20. And this kind of adds an RPG element to Injustice with DC characters. DC characters like Superman, Batman, and all that stuff, you're able to level them up and being able to change them as opposed to how you weren't able to do that, whether it be with the last Injustice game or hell, I would say movies and, and TV shows or whatever, you would just be a spectator. Here, you're able to push them to level 11 or level 20, technically. I was just using that as, a, as an expression, but you're able to push them further than they already were and make them even stronger and actually feel the power of Kal-El or be, feel the, 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 the veracity of Batman. And that is cool. Not only that, because it, you can use these characters in versus mode, whether it be online or locally, 
but then you got the addictive multiverse mode and the multiverse mode is kind of like a play on the tournament ladder matches type of angle from the Mortal Kombat games or other fighting games but here you're able to take these events that are added randomly and have a timer on them sometimes that timer can only be like a good four or five hours or sometimes these events could be up on the map for like literally days days upon days upon days and if I'm not mistaken right now there's actually a movie themed event tied over to the Wonder Woman movie that's going to be there until probably like June 4th or 5th, something like that, so you got a couple of days left. But these multiverse events have their little fights within them, whether it be going up against a set of amount of enemies with a certain difficulty number or level number, or even a quote-unquote boss fight where you take on this one character that is just super maxed out, and it's up to you to be able to match their strength. And for every event that you complete, you gain a tremendous amount of rewards, whether it be credits and source crystals and all these other levels of currency that you can use on either buying mother boxes which again is an element that was taken uh, also or kind of borrowed from other games most notably overwatch where you got those boxes and whenever you get the boxes you can open them up guess what's in there loot gear customization options colors stuff like that stuff that just makes you want to go more and more and continue turn you into a fucking gambler and besides doing that whole repetition thing where you put these characters through the grinder to be able to level them up even if you reach that level 20 you can still add new gear to them to make them even much more powerful stronger quicker agile or much healthier to be that great character and then you could take that character put him through the tournaments online through the guilds and whatnot and then you could see how you fare off against other multiplayer characters of course at that point it's all about how skilled you are not necessarily what type of gear you have but it does have a role to play there and that whole element that whole collective element of being able to level up these characters a, a, a kind of create your own version of a Batman or your own version of a Superman and go and kind of take them like a take them almost like a Pokemon and put them up against somebody else's Batman or somebody else's Superman there's a level of connectivity there that was not found obviously in the first injustice and I don't think I found in any recent fighting game and I think they struck gold with this element here. Plus, there's always a level of management you can have with this gear because you got those regent tokens and those source crystals. I can't remember which one does which, but one of them is able to transform a certain piece of gear to how it originally was. I think that's the regen token. And then the source crystals can be used to transform a piece of gear into one that matches the level that the character you're adding it to is at. So you can always mix and match certain things to be able to make the best character you can. And that always adds a level of replay value because it keeps you wanting to come back for more. And if that wasn't enough, there is a battle simulator within the multiverse mode. And this is kind of like the arcane mode of the Injustice 2 game where you put your characters through a set amount of matches, whether it be on the novice, novice difficulty level or the advanced or master difficulty level. And at the end, you fight Brainiac. And after defeating him, you got this little like cutscene that's not like a pre-rendered cutscene, but it's like a set of really beautifully drawn artwork and over it you have a narration of the character that you played as and everybody's got their own specific ending and so these endings are really cool because it takes what would have been like if this character that you played as not not the one that you played as in the story mode but this specific character that you weren't expecting would have been the victor and you see things play out either for the better or for the worse and that's always cool to see this little uh, closing cinematics even if they're just artwork they're still very cool to kind of play as it's just a shame that to get to them you need to get through mother fucking brainiac because this is probably the one thing that really pissed me off it's funny it pissed me off more than any character did in the story mode or even online or even in the multiverses the random multiverses that were generated from day to day no it was brainiac the one that almost gave me an ulcer because no matter what difficulty you were fighting the characters leading up to that point no matter how strong you are Ed Boon needs to put a fucking piece of shit that spams the same move over and over at the end of his games. Whether it be Shao Kahn in fucking Mortal Kombat or Brainiac in this game who keeps using his fucking tentacle thing because he's in his own little uh, home field on his ship. So he's able to take this claw out of nowhere and with two simple moves he's able to take away literally like two thirds of your health bar. Two thirds? What is that shit? What? What is this shit? <sighs> okay. Calm down. Calm down. So even though I didn't prefer this game's story mode over the first one, and some characters could have been switched for others, but that's completely subjective, and even though Brainiac almost put me in the hospital, this is definitely not only one of the best fighters in recent memory that I devoted the most time to, because I just could not 
put it down because of the addictive loot and gear system, the multiverse events that I wanted to get through to be able to create the perfect fighter, the perfect Bam, whether it be the perfect Batman, the perfect Holly Quinn, the perfect Flash, but also the devotion to the characters and the way that they're presented from the voice acting to the beautiful graphics that have definitely excelled ever since the first Injustice and also the, the replay value, whether it be even within the story mode or within the side stuff that you can do online or offline. Not only is this one of the best fighters in recent memory, but this is probably one of the best games of the year so far. Well, <laughs> it mostly is because... Um, you guys, if you've been following my game reviews, you know that how I feel about games crashing on me. And I hate to do this. And I hate to mark games down for crash, especially when you start to reach the three crash mark during pivotal points where I have to restart segments of the game over. Injustice 2 crashed on me three times. And I love you, Injustice 2. I genuinely do, but... I can't, you know, I can't let my guard down now. I, I can't show weakness. And so for that, I'll be giving Injustice 2 a low 9 out of 10. So please let me know in the comments. If you have played Injustice 2, you bought it day one or you bought it week one, please let me know who's your favorite character that you play as. Who's your least favorite character that you like to play as or don't like to play as? Green Lantern. <clears throat> I just, I, I'm sorry. And do you think that they improved on the first game? Do you think it got worse? Do you think that there's certain things that they could have done better? Any kind of feedback or responses, let them be known in the comments below. Make sure you like and share this video to show your support. And follow me on Instagram and on Twitter, at DarkSpiderDavid. But do not forget, if you guys enjoyed my review of Injustice 2 and would like to purchase the game after having done so, then please use the link in the description below to purchase the game. It would really help me out a lot. It would definitely support me quite a bit, so please do so with that. And also make sure to support the channel by hitting the subscribe button down below. However, I do feel the need to tell you guys this. After this review, this uh, Injustice 2 review, at the timing of this po po posting of this review, I will be taking a slight little break from YouTube. I'm being, I'm getting a little bit of YouTube fatigue from the videos and whatnot. Plus, I'm trying to cultivate this brand new idea of trying to do like a podcast style type of video every week where it's just one video, one long video talking about all the latest things and stuff. So I'm kind of promoting that while at the same time letting you guys know that there may be a slight break between now and the next few videos, just to let you know, just to let, you know, in case some of you are figuring out, uh, trying to wonder at that point, like, where's David? He hasn't posted a video in like a week or so. It's because I am taking a break to kind of focus on just school stuff like that, especially trying to sign up with these damn classes, but trying to sign up for school and trying to do better at work while at the same time trying to cultivate the idea of doing a brand new podcast style type of video weekly that's going to be cool. It's going to have a nice presentation style to it. And at the same time, I just want to get my rest from, from YouTube because I feel like I've been doing a few too many videos and it's just like, okay, yeah, I'm getting a little tired, need a little break. So Please bear with me with that. But that doesn't mean that you cannot subscribe for when those videos do finally return. So make sure you do that. You will not regret it. Until next time, guys, whenever that will be, hopefully within the next couple of weeks or so, I will see you then. Until then, take care. Much blessings.